In this lesson, you will learn how different parts of the brain responsible for self-regulation, reward, learning, and memory change and become rewired during repeated substance use. It's important to understand the neurobiological processes that lead to addiction as they are the same ones involved in recovery. We will begin by testing your knowledge of the brain. Before we do that, we do want to mention that there is a lot of terminology in this lesson, and depending on your background, it may seem like a lot. While it will help you understand exactly how and why addiction develops, you do not need to memorize this material. In a nutshell, you can remember that during addictions, the reward system, the system that says go, overpowers the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that says stop. So let's start with some important brain structures to think about. Quiz, which part of the brain provides executive control and is responsible for self-reflection, assessment, and planning? Which part of the brain processes environmental cues or triggers and decides if that experience was rewarding or aversive? Which part of the brain is critical for the memory of person, places, and things? And lastly, which part of the brain controls the physiologic responses tied to a specific reward? Think you know the answers? Well, let's pause for the quiz. Don't worry about what you got right or wrong because we will talk about how all these parts of the brain interact with each other as an addiction develops. The most important neural pathway involved in substance use disorders is the mesolimbic pathway, often called the reward pathway. This pathway controls our response to natural rewards like food, sex, and social interactions. This is the primal or primitive part of our brain in charge of survival. There are a variety of brain chemicals involved, which include both neurotransmitters and hormones, but the one they all have in common is a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Dopamine can be seen as supercharging, reward-seeking um, via the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens. It is not really a linear process or even a circular process, but for the sake of understanding, think of it this way. The ventral tegmental area, VTA, releases dopamine based on whether or not an environmental stimulant such as drug, stress, or winning a race is rewarding or aversive. The nucleus accumbens receives the dopamine released by the VTA and mediates the rewarding effects of drugs and stimuli. This is where the fun lives. So let's break this down to highlight how these parts work together. The pathway from the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala is involved in learning. The brain says, this feels good. The pathway from the amygdala to the ventral tegmental area is involved in memory. So the brain says, this felt good last time. And the pathway from the amygdala to the nucleus accumbens is involved in emotional cues from both internal and external triggers. The brain says, these are the conditions that led to good feelings. The pathways from the prefrontal cortex to many of these areas are involved with higher order thinking and self-regulation and are referred to as executive functioning. So the brain might say, I know that this felt really good, but it gets in the way of my goals, so I won't do it again. The activation of the mesolimbic pathway tells the individual to, to repeat what it just did to get that reward. It also tells the memory centers in the brains to pay attention to all features of that rewarding experience so it can be repeated in the future. So that is how the brain processes, remembers, and desires rewarding things. And simply put, drugs are rewarding. While intoxicating substances, including stimulants such as cocaine and methamphetamine, opioids and alcohol, act in different ways on the mesolimbic system, they all have a lot in common. Um, most drugs bind to receptors on neurons within the mesolimbic system, either by reducing inhibitory signaling or actively causing dopamine release. Alcohol may be an exception here. 
drugs are dangerous because they cause dopamine release far in excess of what is produced by normal pleasurable stimuli like food, sex, etc., and sends the reward pathway into overdrive. For instance, cocaine increases dopamine release with the burst by a factor of 10. Most brain activity is affected by individual specific genetic makeup, and this is certainly true for substance use. Additionally, when an individual started using impacts the risk of addiction. The younger one starts using, unfortunately, the more efficient intracellular and neuronal communication works. This is due to the fact that myelin, a fatty substance like insulation around a battery wire, helps the signal work fast and efficiently, and it is produced during several periods in younger life. So what happens with repeated substance use? In short, brain habituation. Over time, pathways used repetitively become more efficient, require less and less of a stimulus of thought, and create habits, and also are impacted by your genetics and age of use. The time it takes to achieve this varies with the kind of drug. Ultimately, the distribution of neurotransmitters get all out of kilter. A person that chronically uses a substance now requires a greater amount of neurotransmitters to activate the reward system. This is what is termed tolerance. Studies on animals and humans show that repeated habitual use changes the number and density of receptors for addictive drugs, which is why tolerance develops and changes intracellular signaling molecules and protein expression that are long-term, which explains the persistent craving that follows withdrawal. So what are the consequences of long-term drug use? the brain becomes altered chemically and anatomically. The emotional systems of the brain run rampant and feel out of control. The physical sensation, sensation part of the brain gets badly distorted. The thinking part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex shuts down as the reward system takes over. Everything gets oriented around just trying to feel normal. But is all hope lost? Obviously not. The good news is that just as new pathways form during addiction, the brain can generate new pathways during recovery. There are evidence-based cognitive, behavioral, and pharmacotherapies available to help recalibrate the neural pathways to both strengthen pathways to the prefrontal cortex and to weaken pathways to the reward system. In this module in particular, we will cover how medications can also help quiet the overactive mesolimbic pathway to reduce cravings.